Marcus, right? Lounge in London. <laughs> looks like you're in a big smoking room. <laughs> it looks like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's your man cave. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Somebody's doing everybody. something right. It's, it's got real depth to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Roy's a legend. People, welcome one and all. Welcome to the Light Em Up Lounge. It's Friday evening. I'm delighted to welcome you all to another fantastic session. We have Rick Rodriguez from CAO Cigars with us tonight. We just went live on Facebook. So for all you guys here, please feel free. Hop over on Facebook. You can you can share the post. It's on, on my Ryan Pohoret side and also on Cigar Journal's official side. And without further ado, I would like to welcome... Ricky Rodriguez in his wonderful man cave over in the U.S. Rick, how are you? Good, man. How are you doing today? Very well. And I'm, I'm super excited. I'm very much looking forward to the session. I just lit up the beautiful oh, new yeah. CAO session. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And super, super excited about how that's going to yeah. turn out. Yeah. We have a lot of people joining us um, here at the lounge, but uh, plenty more over on Facebook. As always, if you have any questions, please let us know. Put it in the chat box. You can raise your hand over here on Zoom. And for all of you guys joining us through Facebook, please make sure that you um, put your questions and, and all your thoughts into the comments underneath the video. I'm taking care of all of these. I'm trying tracking them and we'll make sure to forward any questions to Rick. So speaking of another wonderful light em up session and the new CAO session, Rick, you are in your men cave and uh, funnily enough, um, the, the Vitolas of the CAO session are called garage and shop as well. Are you yeah. actually in your garage? I am. Uh, so that, uh, that uh, cigar came about simply uh, when we started to ask the question about that three years ago, what do you uh, want to know about Ricky? And uh, the response back was, we see Ricky uh, doing events all over the world, but does he smoke in this house? And where does he smoke in this house? And so I say, you know what, my man cave. And so that started that uh, kind of the, uh, the talk uh, for marketing me. And I said, okay, the man cave, uh, what else? Uh, and so uh, when, uh, I said, guys, when I'm working on new blends and I bring these new blends home, uh, I usually uh, kind of uh, reach out to my friends and uh, I'll kind of text them and say cigar session. And they'll know that they're going to come by my house to start to sample new pl product that I'm trying to release. And so they love that name session. And now we have to make the cigar. And so about two or, uh, or three years ago, I've always asked this question about the fans for CEO. What do you want from us? And uh, the response uh, all the time, we, we love your dark wrappers. Uh, if you can ever make a cigar with a dark wrapper that gives you a spice and some sweet notes, that would be heaven for us. And that blend, I would love to take credit for that blend, but that blend was de developed by the fans of CEO. So uh, we just took uh, that information back to the factory and uh, the factory started to say, what's the blend? I said, guys, I know exactly the blend we need to work on. This is what the fans want. And then we made that cigar. And that is called Session. Rick, do you think that every man needs a man cave and to have some uh, with, you, you, with friends? You know, I, I, I think you, uh, you do because it, it gives uh, your friends the ability to get together, relax, and not worry about smoking cigars in the house and all that. So I always surprise when, when I go to somebody's house and they allowed me to smoke inside their house. Like, wow, okay, you're the man of your castle because I cannot smoke in a cigar at my house. So uh, when uh, we uh, just uh, started to do the uh, man cave or uh, build this uh, this area, I, ha I had in mind my friends and uh, uh, give them a place to sit down, relax, and enjoy a cigar with me. Yeah, so if you can, do it. If you can't, you know, it's just, there's a, a lot of great shops that you can get together and smoke the cigars. What does that actually mean to you personally? Like to have that opportunity, uh, get together with your pals, sit down, have a cigar, calm down, relax. And even like, even if it's working on blends, you know, or doing something in, in, in your role as a master blender with CAA or, or just, you know, in, in, in private atmosphere, sitting down with your pals and relaxing. What, what does that mean? Where, where does it come into your sort of daily routine and, and, and your life? You know, it's everything. My friends are everything to me. 
So uh, I'm kind of the person that uh, doesn't uh, spend a lot of time alone. Uh, I rarely smoke a cigar by myself. I've always reached out to anybody and everybody to join me because uh, I like the conversations. I let, you know, I like to get with my friends and talk about life. And we share a lot of information back and forth about life. We uh, uh, joke, we watch games, we share spirits together, we share beers together. But for me, uh, without my friends, I'm nobody. So to uh, provide a situation that my friends can come to my house and enjoy it, it's everything. Because I've always been like that guy. I've always uh, been a guy that uh, has uh, the ability to, cr- uh, to connect uh, people together. And uh, I think this is a beautiful thing because everybody's different. I don't want a, a, you know, a lot of Ricky sitting in my, you know, uh, my garage because I'm Ricky. So I need that input from my friends. And the char- uh, cast of characters that I have is something I, I really enjoy. Yeah, for sure. Now, would that approach be different when you're actually working on blends or when, you, when you're when sampling some cigars for work? Or would you still surround yourself with your pals and, and, and have the, these conversations and the exchange with all the people around you? I think uh, when we're, uh, I'm working on a blend and uh, the friends came over or come over to the house, uh, we concentrate on that blend. We talk, uh, we tend to talk only about that cigar because I want that uh, negative and positive feedback. And so I surround my guys not with yes men. So every cigar I give them, they're going to say, oh, my God, that's a great cigar. And like turn around like, oh, my God, that's horrible. But uh, they're very honest with me. And so as a manufacturer, I can share this information. You think when we get together with you guys and we offer you a new cigar that we want to see a, a person, you know, smoke a cigar. Oh, my God, that's great. Uh, that's a kind of a thank you. But w- what the manufacturer is more interested in is a guy in the back that's smoking that cigar. And you can see by his face, he's not enjoying that cigar. And that is the guy that I'm going to connect with and say, hey, Kay, can you talk to me about that cigar? Hey, bro, you know, I'm sure you worked hard on the cigar, but I don't like it. Now, if you just say I don't like it and walk away, you're an asshole. Not because you didn't like my cigar, but do you didn't share why you didn't like it. That information is very valuable to a cigar manufacturer. So when, if, if any time you're uh, uh, able to get around a, uh, a blender or any a manufacturer, even a salesman, be honest. And if you can say, I didn't like it because I'm, you know, I thought it was more body. I want more flavor or more spice or more sweetness. We heard, uh, you know, we hear that. And that is what uh, we're going to take back to the factory. So that negative input so much time is more valuable to us than the positive. I love it. Okay, thank you so much. Next. So, yeah. So anytime you have the ability to share either positive or negative, share it with uh, everybody because they will learn from that. They love that. I just think that approach is wonderful, but it's it's actually quite different because sometimes, you know, when, when you're around master blenders, you know, they, they need to be in their zone, they need to focus, and they'd much rather not have any people around them or or have any other um, opinions, but but really focus on the, the path ahead and the job they need to fulfill. But your approach with, with that more convivial uh, setting and, and bringing in all those people, I think is highly interesting. If you look at my team in the factories, we have about uh, six people that uh, get together to work on the blend. And so that's six people uh, are, you know, I trust them to, to be honest and say, Ricky, if your target's X, Y, Z, you're not delivering on that X, Y, Z. You're more ABC. So we need to, uh, you know, kind of tweak this blend. So that input is very valuable. So that is going to get me to narrow down 50, 40 blends to uh, the top three. And the top three is what I bring home and start to share with my friends, shop owners, consumers, uh, salesmen. What's your input? They're saying, you know, three cigars. We don't know what or what to, uh, a cigar reaches that target. So your input is very valuable. So I think, yes, I agree with you that uh, we have to focus but the more that you have input, uh, the better chance are you going to deliver exactly the target you want to uh, achieve. Now, actually, you 
you have a family background um, with cigars and the round tobacco, but you didn't sort of grow up in the fields or in the curing barns. Um, give us a little bit of a of a background story about Ricky Rodriguez and your early days, how you actually got into cigars and how you discovered your passion for the leaf. Uh, you know what, uh, my grandfather and grandmother were rollers in Cuba on my father's side and they came to uh, Tampa, I think in 1953. In 52, Tampa was out producing Cuba, making Cuban cigars. We have more manufacturing, more rolling, uh, more factories in Tampa than Cuba did. And so my grandfather was laid off. And I think my grandmother and grandfather moved to Tampa in 1953. And my father followed them in 1955. So that started, you know, visiting my grandfather's home and watching my grandfather smoke one cigar a night after work. And my grandmother enjoyed one cigar a week uh, on a Sunday. So we went to her house, uh, their house, and uh, when uh, we're done with lunch on Sunday, we used to go outside to the back and play in the backyard, and my grandmother would come out to watch us, and she would light her cigar. So my image right now that's playing, I mean, like it was yesterday, my image is my grandmother smoking a cigar, and uh, that aroma of cigars were always in the house. My father never smoking a cigar in his life. And so, fast forward, uh, growing up in Tampa, uh, cigars were everywhere. So for me to you, I, I think for us, um, I didn't really start to, uh, to enjoy cigars uh, until later in life. I was a, a casual smoker, one or two cigars a year. And then I went, uh, worked with a General Cigar about 21 years ago. And that really uh, kind of uh, taught me uh, about cigars because you have to smoke it as a, you know, a salesman. And we started to smoke the cigars and uh, I really got into it. And what really separated me, uh, rated me from the other reps is uh, I was always interested in the stories behind uh, the cigar. I really then uh, was not interested in the selling of the cigar. I'm more interested in the storytelling about the cigar. So I was always one of these guys that uh, was able to kind of share the stories behind the cigar. Because 20 years ago, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, events, uh, you know, in the world. Uh, maybe once in a while you have a, a, a master blender that would visit uh, your shop. But uh, it wasn't like today. Today, you can reach out and touch Rocket Patel, uh, Papin, uh, the Fuentes, uh, me. So you have the, uh, you know, the luxury to, you know, uh, go to the shop and meet these guys that are making the cigars. But uh, back in the day, it really was up to the reps to explain what we do and the stories behind it. So that really started me and that caught the eye of the owner of General Cigar at that time, uh, Mr. Coleman. And so I was a salesman for about four years. And then I remember Ms. Mr. Coleman approached me one day and said, Ricky, I need some help. And I said, sir, whatever you uh, need from me, the answer is yes, because I love your company. I love our cigars. Uh, he says, we need to prepare for the future because a lot of our blenders are going to be retire or we're going to leave the, uh, uh, the industry. And so we need to prepare for uh, a gentleman to become a blender. And uh, whatever reason they chose me, I, still to this day, I don't know why they chose me, but they did. And I started the process of, uh, training and learning about the, the techniques of uh, about uh, you know uh, growing tobacco, fermenting tobacco, uh, aging tobacco, all the process that happened in the factory. So I spent about uh, six months in the DR learning that process. How do we uh, receive a tobacco on the back door of our factory and what the process is uh, to uh, the final boxing and shipping. But uh, blending came about when I started to work with Benji Menendez. Benji really taught me the art of blending cigars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent about five years with uh, Benji traveling the U.S. And, uh, you know, just kind of in the background, uh, learning from him how he shared the stories behind the cigars, uh, how he talked about what we do and how mellow and how kind of, you know, he had a, a, a great um, 
uh, kind of a situation to, uh, you know, if, if the room had 500 people in one question or answer, he just talked to that one guy. And I learned from that. So it, it was amazing because if you look at my training, I was trained by four Hall of Famers. In the U.S., there's a Hall of Fame of blenders or, or you know, uh, manufacturers. And there's only 11 people in the Hall of Fame. And I was lucky enough to be trained by four of the 11 people. Yeah, so again, uh, my life has never been the same, never been the same. And I, I still, to this day, wake up every uh, morning and say, let's go to work. I, I say work, but it's not work because I l love what I do. I, not enough to not be paid, but I love <laughs> what I do. Riggy, honestly, I, I love that story. And I've, I've heard it a couple of times, but I can't get enough of, of, yeah. of hearing it back over again yeah. because it, it feels the very same for me. I mean, I, I have these fun memories of me being three years old and standing in the kitchen with my grandfather and my grandmother kneading dough and, and baking bread. And, and we never had much, but it, it's, it's these aromas and flavors. It's these memories back from the family table. And it feels the very same when you talk about these aromas that you had lingering around at the house that sort of inspired you and influenced you from the very beginning. And you probably didn't realize back then, but at some point you, you just get it later on in your life and you sort of yeah. go back to these roots. And then it's, then it's really when, when you start to, to discover your passion and, and go deep and, and, and do what you love. And uh, so I was curious, was it sort of the same the same discovery journey for yourself as well that you sort of went back to your roots so how did you actually start with general what was the inspiration to to get that job you know what i was recruited uh, by a gentleman uh, that uh, was uh, his name is dave bullock uh, now he's the uh, 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 vice president of sales for rocky patel but he recruited me into general cigar and i remember i was in the carpet business and i was making some good money but I didn't really believe in what I'm doing. And so he approached me two or three times because he was working for next least the first time and making a uh, selling chocolate bars. So I'm like, eh, I want you to work with me. I don't want to sell candy bars. And then he tried to recruit me again to sell baked beans, like baked beans, like a can of baked beans. I don't want that job either. And then out of the blue, he called me about three years later and said, Ricky, uh, I'm working for General Cigar. I said, who's General Cigar? Uh, oh, they make Macanil, Cohiba, Particus, Hoya, Punch, uh, Excalibur. Oh, those are great lines. Uh, I want you to work with us. And so I left the uh, carpet uh, business and really just leaked off to the side of that building because uh, I took a uh, pay uh, decrease of about 50%. What I was making... And what they started me with, it was a huge decrease. But I just felt in my heart, in my soul, this is the place I should be. And I just took that leap of faith. And thank God uh, I did because it changed my life. I never looked back. And thank God I'm not doing a Zoom event trying to sell carpet to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Our big beans. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, what so. was that process like when when you actually learned that you were going to become a, a master blender and you mentioned you went through um, all the different factories and you learned from some of the the, the all stars in the industry um, was it really this like overwhelming sensation at the very beginning where, where you were like how on earth am I ever gonna you know fulfill that role or were you very confident from the very beginning you know what? I think uh, my time in the life, uh, I was 40 years old when I joined uh, General Cigar. And I, I think it would be different if I was 20 or 30 years old, because you at 20 or 30, you're filled with piss and vinegar and you think you're better than you are. And so I think uh, my training of sales throughout my life taught me how to be humble and to how to shut my mouth and open my eyes and ears. And so when that job came about and that uh, the opportunity for me to start to uh, learn about blending or the process of tobacco, I are already knew my job for the next year is to shut my mouth, open my eyes and listen to these gentlemen. They're willing to share their knowledge with me. 
So I never took anybody for granted. Even the rollers I was working with for a month, uh, I realized I'm not going to be a roller. I should be. I well, really, you're just a ro- bro. I was all in because these guys were uh, sitting uh, down and sharing their knowledge with me. And so my job was just to, uh, to take it all in. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the event uh, or in the training uh, to be a blender, then you can start to highlight what you know and uh, share what you know. But uh, at the beginning, it wasn't that uh, uh, that time for me to shine. Uh, my time was like Benji, stay in the background and out of the spotlight and just listen and learn uh, from these legendary I'm not even uh, legendary tobacco guys, rollers. I, my first job in the factory uh, as a blender or, or, you know, was sweeping the floor. And I said, well, really? I'm here to be a cigar master. Nope. I picked up that broom and started sweep uh, for two weeks. And I swept and swept and I never looked up and never ever say, why am I sweeping floors? I should be working with tobacco. Never. You know, so, uh, I knew my uh, position and I knew what I needed to do. So shut up, listen and learn. Ricky, that really says a lot about you as a, as a person and as a, as a professional. But um, I mean, that's, that's a very humble and grateful approach that probably not a, long, a lot of young people nowadays would actually follow, right? right. Um, we had a great question regarding that from Leo, who's joining us from France. Good to see you, Leo. Um, hello, Renhard. Um, hello, um, remember me? We met us in the CIA lounge in, uh, in Paris. And uh, remember I had uh, the CIO uh, pictures on, the, on my screen? Yes, yes. I remember. And, and guess what? I still have the CIO pictures. I still have <laughs> this uh, CIO pictures. So, okay. So remember, I grew up a little bit. I starting to be more um, influent on my uh, CIA Instagram page. So which advice you can say to tell to yourself now um, when you start the, to jump in the cigar industry when you start at the beginning? For example, we have Yurik now and on the left of your side, you have you, but at the beginning, which kind of advice you can tell to, to yourself or even some people who really are passionate about the cigar industry? You know, my, uh, my response to uh, just listen, uh, you know, open your eyes and you open your ears to because a lot of people are willing to share, but they're only going to take the time to share their knowledge with somebody that uh, uh, kind of responds positive to that situation. Because if you think, what am I going to learn from that dude uh, sitting there? He's just a, a trash man. Really? He has a story to share with you about your passion. And so if you just kind of uh, let them uh, talk to you and just, you know, you know, take yourself away from that uh, situation and just concentrate on what that gentleman or lady start trying to do for you and uh, uh, help you grow as a human uh, sometimes. So a lot of uh, things that I can say, a lot of the uh, samples I, Benji, uh, somebody, what did you learn uh, from Benji the most? You think my uh, answer would be tobacco. No, I learned how to be a better husband, a better father, a better friend uh, and uh, uh, my life. So I owe Benji more, not about tobacco, how to be a good man. So yeah, everybody's willing to teach you. But uh, you know what? Humble yourself and say, I don't care what I need to do. I love this industry. I want to be a part of it uh, from a shop guy to a salesman to a blender or work. I don't care. If you love something, you'll try anything and everything that is offered to you. And that I think that uh, will help you uh, in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, like, I would like to say like a big thank you because... Uh, when we met us, we cannot uh, meet us like more real for the cigar competition because he was with uh, Guillaume Tesson, Marco Bilic, and all the gang. Um, after all these things happened, because this, between two uh, opportunities, I moved uh, forward in my career. And then 
Um, I hope I'm going to see you soon, maybe in uh, in America. I'm moving uh, to America. So if you are around California, let me know. I will be more than happy to, to visit where I will be and enjoy yeah. a cigar with you. And I still have this uh, Seao um, Amazon in my humidor. It's almost right. one year, one year half already in my humidor. So maybe I'm going to smoke it tomorrow and share the picture with all the team. Yeah, maybe uh, you have, uh, is your mother still around? Maybe uh, for Mother's Day, you smoke that cigar in your honor of your mother and say, Mama, yes. maybe I can't reach out to yes. you because of this, but I'm going to smoke a special cigar and, you know, uh, think about you. I think that would be a beautiful th thing to uh, for you to do for yes. your mother. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yes, I, 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 where are you going to go to? Thank you very much. And yeah. see. Where are you uh, going to move to uh, California? Where? Which, uh, I'm part going of to move to uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay. Really? Ooh, okay. Yeah. 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 Really. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, I'll definitely see you. There's a great shop in San Francisco <laughs> uh, that you need to visit. Uh, uh, I think it's a, a combination of a, a store in the, uh, uh, at the, uh, the first floor. They have a menswear. And the second floor, watches the third floor, and cigar lounge on the fourth floor. And it's beautiful. I mean, you, all, you already get me. I want to go. I can't wait to stay anymore in France. I want to travel now and yeah. uh, hope to have a smoke with you in this place. can be really, really amazing. Thank you very much uh, for your, I your Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. You know, I'm really glad that we get to, to to share so many wonderful stories and connect people from all over the world through this initiative. And I'm, I'm beyond grateful that we had so many fantastic sessions and great guests, be it yeah. here at the lounge or over on Facebook. So many people watching and, and, and asking all these beautiful questions. We truly appreciate it. So thank you for all that. Um, Ricky, I would love to to actually talk about the the Amazon trilogy that, that you did. But before that, um, you have a wonderful picture in, in your background. Just behind your right shoulder um, of the um, CEO OSA. And I yeah. know this is uh, a very special project to you and certainly also a special cigar to me because it was one of the first um, premium handmade cigars that I ever smoked. And I have fond memories of that. Tell us a little bit about that beautiful story. So uh, I was a blender for La Gloria. When I uh, was done with training, I went to uh, work with La Gloria. And La Gloria, we're going to lose uh, Ernesto Chris Creel. He's going to uh, retire. And uh, it took three people to take over for him. And so he was such a, a, a legendary guy. Uh, so we formed a team uh, with me, Michael Giannini, and uh, Yuri uh, was in charge of the factory and the DR. And we had that team set up and we were uh, working together for about uh, 18 months. And then we merged with CAO. And all of a sudden I got a kind of a tip on my shoulder. I said, Ricky, we're done with you in La Gloria. We're going to now ship you to Nicaragua and you're going to start to work with CAO. And that, at that time, I kind of didn't want to go because I'm so happy with the, uh, the, uh, the lines from uh, La Gloria that I didn't really, really want to go to CAO. But uh, my job is not to say what I want to do. My job is just to listen to these guys and say, we're not asking you, we're telling you, you're going to go to uh, you know, uh, Nicaragua and start to work with uh, CAO. And so when we got there, um, uh, the first tobacco, if you look at the DNA of uh, you know, uh, CAO, they're always the first to introduce some tobaccos. They were the first to really introduce the uh, uh, Brazilian rappers to the uh, world. Uh, they were the first to use a, uh, uh, a filler from uh, Italy in their cigars. They're the first to use Colombia. So the DNA was set up for us already. So when we got uh, the opportunity to work with this new rapper from uh, Nicaragua, and uh, Honduras uh, from Osa, uh, we knew right away we wanted to uh, work on that with that tobacco. But again, the stories behind the cigar has to be related back to that cigar. So if you look at that design of that box, why is white? Why is there a kind of a river? And why is that river green? So if you look at the farm, the farm is separated from Honduras and Nicaragua, the border. And there's a river that runs through that area. 
that so one side is Nicaragua, the other side is Honduras. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting. So we maybe we'll copy that river form. But it was the only time that I've ever been to a farm situation that I saw white barns, whitewashed barns, because typically 90 percent of the time the barns are either black or uh, I mean brown or gray. Mm -hmm. But there was a first time I said, why is your barn white? And said so the, the guy in the farm says, why not? Everybody else is the same. Uh, so we just painted ours white. So the, the box is white because it represents the barns that the uh, curing uh, for the tobacco and the river. I didn't like the, uh, the white and the blue because I think that represents to me a mall cigar. And so we said, OK, tobacco is green. The river is there. Uh, the, the, uh, the box is white. So it all goes in play. So uh, it was a very uh, kind of uh, important story to say. And even to the point, if you look at your band, there's some codes. And if you enter those codes in Google Earth, it'll show you exactly where that farm is or location. And you can see them growing tobacco. So all that uh, came into play. And it was a, a huge hit for us. And then uh, it was very popular in America. But for whatever reason, it took Europe by storm, mm -hmm. by storm. And they love that cigar. They love the sizes. The, they looked, they were saying to me, uh, it re really reminds me a lot of a, a Cubanesque cigar, uh, the way you roll it, the way you, uh, we taste it. So we didn't, pers uh, you know, seek out to do that. But if the fans are saying to us, it reminds me of what we love, Cuba tobacco, perfect, perfect. Was yep. that really the kickstart for you and, and the moment that ignited your passion for CAO? Because you mentioned at the beginning, you, you were not that fond of, of that yep. change. Yep. But I guess that was really what kickstarted the whole thing for you. Yeah, yeah, well, it is. And then uh, I learned from that situation because my head, because the success we had of OSA out of the gate, uh, I thought, OK, got this. I got this. And uh, my uh, my tobacco angels uh, touched me, and he, oh, you think you're ready? We're going to do something, and we launched this second year a line called Concert, an epic failure. I mean, failure, and that really brought me down to earth, and that really taught me, hey, bro, you are, you know, you think you're ready for the big time? You're not. So you know, go back to work. Uh, learn from your uh, people and learn from your, you know, uh, learn from the uh, fans of CEO and start to listen more than you want to talk about this cigar. So we learned because the, what happened for a concert was a presentation. The cigar was great, but the presentation, the, the, the story behind it didn't resonate with anybody and it was just a failure. And that really kind of, uh, we regrouped and said, okay, we had a home run for the uh, first one, and we struck out in the ninth inning uh, uh, the second one. What are we going to do for the third one? And the third one happened to uh, be uh, Flathead, and Flathead just, boom, uh, really took off. And that was the first cigar that uh, I think everybody realized uh, there's a new sheriff in town, and it's called General Cigar. And, uh, and it's uh, Ricky and the team behind CAO to, uh, today. So that really taught me a lesson. Very interesting point that you brought up here. And that is um, like the cigar can be great, but it's truly the overall experience that you have with the new line. It's the attention to detail. Like as you mentioned with OSA, that, that code on the back and, and going on, on, on Google Earth and finding that spot. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous effort in, in, in really considering all these small little details. But w where do you see the, the, that fine line of failure and success when you come up with a new cigar? And it's not always the product, as you mentioned. It's, it's like, it's everything. Thing, but how do you then as a as a master blender make sure that you come up with something that truly has the chance to hit the market and be an a, a tremendous success right out of the gates uh listen to the fans uh listen to the fans uh because uh, uh you know after uh we launched uh, a flathead uh we started to listen to the fans so if you look at the next year what we did 
was when we launched Flathead, uh, I was getting this response back all the time. What about us? I'm like, who are you? Well, Flathead talks to a car guy and truck guy because it's based on the old Ford engine. What about us? And who are you? We're bikers. We drive bikes. And so do you realize that Harley Davidson launched a Flathead engine before Ford did? Because I don't drive a bike. I said, no, I didn't know that. So we knew that we want to extend the line called Flathead, but uh, do something else. And so I said to marketing, yeah, the fans of CEO want something for them, the bikers. And so what do you mean? Well, we're going to extend the line called Flathead, but we're going to uh, do another blend and we're going to offer another experience and called Steel Horse. Steel Horse is the term that they use for their bikes all the time in the U.S. So if you say to, I'm going to ride my bike, bro, you're going to ride your steel horse. And so, again, listen to the fans. That will help you uh, launch the cigars. And so we have not had a failure uh, since concert. You know, uh, not, you know, not saying every cigar that we were launched is like, uh, you know, a basin or a flathead, uh, uh, you know, but uh, we have not had any failures that we learned from like we did for a concert for sure. Do you think that CAO in particular has like a real cult following and these loyal fans that, that have clear expectations of what CAO has to be? Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, because they, again, what they're wanting from CAO is you, new. Uh, so that's a beauty of working for, for CAO. Sometimes a manufacturer will get kind of cornered in the market. And meaning there's a line or two out there when they release a new cigar, they already know, oh, it's going to be full body. It's going to be spicy. That is what they're known for. And so it's very hard for them to uh, introduce a mild cigar because, oh, I'm not buying your cigar for a mild cigar experience. So, but for, uh, 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 for CAO, uh, when you look at our line, it's unlike any line that we have in general cigar lines because we have flavors, we have um, a mild body cigars, we have medium body cigars, we have uh, full body cigars, we have uh, different tobaccos like the Amazon, the Italian tobacco. Uh, so that is kind of fun for us because our slate is always blank. It's not halfway painted, you can only do this. And so uh, that is something, so the fans of CEO really were hurt when General Cigar took it over because they were worried that we're going to destroy what they left. And my job is not to destroy anything. My job is to create new, but leave alone the old, like Brasilia. Brasilia is a great uh, a lesson for us because we uh, kind of treat that uh, tobacco, the process of tobacco, different than any other tobacco we ever use. But if we change that technique, we change that blend. So I remember having to uh, talk to the president at the time and said, if I change this Brasilia and start to ferment it the way we ferment it, we're going to change that line. So he says, what do you want to do? Sir, I want to leave it the same way. Well, we don't do that. Well, I need to do it. And so we still continue to do a process uh, for that tobacco that we do not do for any other cigar but it works for that cigar. So it's not my job to improve it because I'm going to improve it for me, not the fans of that cigar. So that's not my style. Very interesting. And especially interesting that you have such a close connection with um, the, the, the management team and, and the, the, the top tier of general and um, that obviously helps you an awful lot to sort of um, bring these very boutique-y um, cigars um, even though you're part of such a big corporation and we have a great question regarding that from Ian. Hi I'm enjoying the uh, Brasilia and I've got a good ash it'll probably fall off in a second yeah. and uh, I enjoyed the flathead at uh, Puro Sabor in Nicaragua I had a few of them there really loved that haven't had the chance to try the Osa, but I must look that out. My question was, obviously, General is a massive company, mm -hmm. but see, you seem to have sort of a boutique ethos. And I just wondered, 
about the relationship with management and how much freedom they give you and whether they ever try to sort of tell you, well, we want a much more commercial cigar or they let you let you have your head and, and do it your own way? No, uh, you know, they're smart enough to, you know, uh, learn from uh, past. Uh, so we did uh, do that in past cigars that we bought as a company uh, and we changed that company to kind of fit our company. And so we learned from that. So when they talk to me about uh, working with CAO, they say, Ricky, we're going to give you the keys to the factory and we want you to just try to be them inside the General Cigar. So I have never, there was a, before Flathead, I'll share this story. Then I'll sh I kind of prove this point. Before Flathead, I typically they give you a year to work on a blend. That's going to be six months for the blend and six months for the packaging. And I was uh, working in this, uh, this situation that we could not reach a target for the blend. And then they kind of overtook the blend and started to design the box behind my back. And so they had the box designed and they're waiting for me to deliver the blend. So I remember calling the guys and uh, the president of the company, guys, I'm out. I, I can't do this blend because they wanted a blend with five fillers, a different a binder and a different wrapper. So about five separate cigars, uh, uh, to, uh, tobaccos, and it didn't work. And I said, I can't not stand in front of anybody and pretend I love this cigar because they're going to read my space and I'm not going to be able to sell it. So I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I remember they're saying, Ricky, if you don't have a cigar uh, that cigar made by a month, we have no cigar to share with your the uh, the show at the trade show. And I said, I'd rather go to the trade show with nothing new than to force me to kind of share a cigar that I don't believe in. And then General Cigar had the uh, the smart enough to say, you know what, what do you want to do? I had this crazy name called Flathead, and I want and what's Flathead? based on an old car engine, pinup girls, and I think I have a blend that I want to use. Ricky, you have about a week to do this. And uh, we kind of fucking focused, and we designed the blend and the box in less than uh, four days. And it was off and uh, running. So we learned from that. So, no, I have never been in a meeting that uh, was forced for me to use the tobacco are first for me to make a, a cigar that, that I don't believe in or the team doesn't believe in. So yeah, it works uh, like very well. It really does. Thank yeah. you. And tell us a bit more about the flathead and about the blend and how that uh, that, that came about. You know, the, uh... so the flathead, uh, again, uh, we uh, started and uh, because we had no time, um, I made one blend and the team went, made one blend and we started to share bl uh, the blend. And uh, my blend was a blend that, okay, okay, the other blend set aside. We think we can work with this blend. But when we were making the cigar, it was originally going to be a round cigar. And we were smoking, and I said, guys, to me, the flavor is not there because the smoke is too hot in my mouth. So uh, I need to cool it. So either we have to redesign the blend or somehow cool this blend down without doing another blend and my roller that uh, sits behind me all the time that rolls the, the, the blends for me i said ricky why don't we box press the cigar wow okay L okay less box press and about 24 hours later we sampled that cigar again and it worked so when the raw cigar you have the ability to kind of only draw smoke and the uh the air through the cigar and if the tobacco don't work well, it's going to create a heat in that smoke and the less flavor. But when you have a box press, when you kind of draw the cigar, you also have air flowing it through your side of the mouth because you can't shut your lip. And that's mm -hmm. going to cool that cigar smoke down, thus more flavor. So every box press on the market is trying to cool that cigar smoke in your mouth. Uh, to uh, uh, to be able to deliver more flavor. And that is the secret behind it because it's like homework. Back in the day in school, you remember the project was given to you and you have six weeks to work on that project. 
and you wait and wait, 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 wait. I was always a kid on Sunday uh, you know, evening. Oh, my God, my project is due tomorrow. I had six weeks to work on it, but now, but I was focused to do that project because I have no time. So sometimes I think more time is, doesn't equal better sometimes. I think uh, more time you start to blend and blend, overthink it, and sometimes you need to just focus. And uh, because, because we had no time, I think we focused a lot of that blend and we uh, did something amazing. Yeah. Well, I've learned something tonight. I mean, I didn't know about the box press being a cooler smoke. That's a very yep. interesting point. Thank you. So uh, everybody, uh, everybody thinks uh, because it doesn't roll away. That's the reason we make a box press cigar. No, no. It goes on the golf course. <laughs> exactly. Or your boat. It doesn't roll away. But the, what we're trying to do as a manufacturer is cool that cigar smoke. I'll share this. When you are smoking a, uh, a cigar and it's burning hot, and you're constantly kind of hot boxing and like. That's going to create a hot smoke. It's like a soup. If I'm cooking soup in the stove and it's boiling away and because I want you to taste the soup before I serve it and I spoon it out of that uh, pot and I, uh, put it in your mouth, you're going to do one or two things. You're going to spit it out because it's so hot or you're going to swallow it very uh, quickly. And I would say, did you taste the onions and carrots and celery? Bro, I didn't taste anything. It was so hot. Now, serve that same soup in a bowl. Let it cool down. You can taste everything. So if we can slow you down and smoking your cigars, uh, you're going to get more flavor. Or we can box press it, and we're going to cool that uh, cigar smoke down. Very interesting point, Ricky. And, and just because Bruce Bush keeps sort of Zoom bombing into your screen there, <laughs> he actually had a question and I wanted to bring it up. Um, you're supposed to tell us a little bit about Little Ricky. What's that story? <laughs> uh, little Ricky has uh, been all over the world. As a matter of fact, uh, I, Bruce just gave me Little Ricky. Let's see. Little oh, Ricky. nice. Yeah, so... I think, uh, you know, if you, if you ever want to know if you've made it in any business, when they give you a bobblehead, you you, you, you kind of say, <laughs> I made it, I made it. Uh, but uh, Rick, uh, Little Ricky, yeah, Little Ricky has been all over the world. It is uh, a thing that everybody wants. Uh, it's amazing. But uh, yeah, Little Ricky is Little Ricky. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. So. We're, we're glad to have little Ricky on the show as well. <laughs> we had another great question from Johan, and I'm super glad to see my brother Johan on the call. Ricky, um, I have a question. I mean, I know a, a lot of your cigars, uh, at least the ones which are available here in Austria. And um, I, uh, I attend one event you made when you introduced the Pilon to Austria, which I really... I think I learned a lot in those two hours, which were just amazing how you presented everything and how you talked about cigars. Thank you. Uh, what, what I want to know from you, is there, a, could you give me any tips or ask any tips how to train our palate, maybe to get some more out of the cigar, except slower smoking, but is there something we can do or I can do to, I mean, to, to taste the, the different tobaccos from the origin, is there anything how, or is it just experience when you smoke, I don't know, 5,000 cigars with uh, Nicaraguan tobacco, Dominican uh, tobacco, but to get out the, the specific tastes of a tobacco, is there a chance? Yeah, it is uh, yeah, it, the way we do it, uh, but it's very hard uh, because uh, that's the reason I really don't talk about blends that often. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't hate the uh, question, what's a blend? My thing is, or I can say the blend is this and this and this. What does that mean to you? Because what it means to me, you're smoking a cigar that is combining all these tobaccos. Unless I have a Fuma that I can share with you, and a Fuma will help you start to pick up the notes of that tobacco. But without Fumas, it's very hard to teach your palate what am I enjoying in that cigar? We're all going to taste sweetness, spice, peppers, notes, earth notes, and all that. Those are uh, the notes or are, are flavors that are going to overwhelm you. But the little notes of flavor 
it's hard to get that in your mind because unless you fo uh, focus on that one tobacco and then, okay, smoke that Fuma and it's spicy and smoke another Fuma, it's sweet, and another Fuma that tastes like coffee or earth, and then you have that blend uh, together, oh, wow, now I taste that coffee note. Now I taste that because what happens usually is we're trying to concentrate on one tobacco, the, uh, the, uh, the wrapper. The wrapper is what we want you to taste. So uh, as a cigar smoker, when you're smoking a cigar, you're really tasting uh, that, that wrapper, but you're not really understanding the blend and that what that blend has to offer you. And so it's very hard to train your palate if you're not able to have access to every tobacco in that blend and smoke that one tobacco. If we had Fuma for you to sample, uh, you can say, okay, okay, now that little note of that uh, nutty flavor comes from that tobacco because I smoked only that tobacco. So it's very hard to train your palate. And I've always said to everybody, as a cigar smoker, what you taste is not what your friend takes. And it's amazing to us. And when you smoke a cigar, you say, oh, popcorn. Really? Popcorn. And I'm smoking the same cigar. Popcorn? I don't say what I taste is what I taste. And what you taste is what you taste. It's up to you to say to yourself, I don't know. I think I taste popcorn or nut or earth or coffee or licorice or cherry or whatever you taste. If you enjoy it, that's what you taste. But for me to say, when I never do this. When you experience our cigar from CEO, uh, I want you to taste popcorn and licorice and coffee and sweetness. It's so hard because every polish, uh, polish is different. But to answer your question, without you sampling each individual tobacco is very hard to you to say, uh, this has Nicaraguan SLE in it. If you don't know what Nicaraguan SLE tastes like alone. Yeah. I mean, I had the opportunity in Las Vegas, I think it was 2017 when you um, introduced the uh, Macanudo Inspirado white and black, where you had that single sticks that uh, the puros of the, of the three tobaccos. I mean, it was really interesting to smoke just the wrapper, just the binder, just the filler, and then yep. in combination of the cigar. It, yeah, that's the best way. So if we can give you more of those samples and you start to really concentrate on those flavors that that tobacco, I guarantee you'll start to, even if it's subtle, and they, even if it's, it's like a notes are very kind of calm, you can pick it up. But uh, my palate is not trained. Um, I think uh, if you want to look at one of my friends, uh, 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 you know, uh, Bruce is one of the guys that really can explain flavors better than I can. Can he make a better cigar than him? No, I can't. I'm sorry, he can't. But I think he can explain to you flavor. To me, I, I've always uh, judged my cigars this way. I like it. I don't like it. That's it. Really simple. For me, it's at the end of the day, is it simple or not? Okay. Thank you. And Bruce, you're absolutely right. I think that's the quintessential part here for, for all the passionados to... To, to judge the cigar by whether you like it or not. And then the, the aromatic profile and some of these subtle nuances that you get out of it uh, really come down to also your, your personal experience that you have because sensory ultimately is, is building analogies and finding your, your own vocabulary to sort of express those things that that your perception gets and right. and then you, you you try to verbalize it and sort of just you know share the experience with other people and all these experiences are different but obviously for you as a as a master blender you also have the challenge of um building a cigar building a blend 
that can deliver on all different levels and yes. that's sweetness it's spiciness like with the, with the session in particular i get a lot of sweetness and spiciness on the palate but also a beautiful citrusy freshness in the back that sort of keeps my palate engaged and mm -hmm. it, it just makes for for a very lively and energetic experience overall. And I think that's very important with a cigar to, to have just that, that subtle nuance and that touch of acidity uh, for in me, order to, yeah. to keep your palate excited. Yeah, for me, uh, what we don't want to deliver is a, a cigar that you light and in the beginning, in the middle, in the end is one flavor, one mm -hmm. dimension. I think it was very boring. Uh, so we, w what we to, uh, try to do is give you an experience that is going to start halfway, change, and the, uh, the end of the cigar changes. So we love that. So I, I want you to smoke a cigar that uh, starts this way and halfway, wow, there's a new flavor. And about uh, three quarters away, okay, what is another flavor? And that is the tobaccos that we uh, pick and we knew that uh, when we lay the tobaccos in that blend, uh, one tobacco takes a long time to heat up to offer that flavor to you. And that tobacco, if you wanted that experience to be in the beginning, you have to select that tobacco and use more of that tobacco in the beginning. But if you want that kind of that flavor in the end, you only use one piece of the tobacco that takes the time to heat up and all of a sudden, there's an explosion, the flavor that's new to your palate. Yep. And especially with the session, like that little sprinkle of citrus, it's like grating some citrus zest or just yep. a drop of, of lemon juice yep. at the very end when you're cooking to sort of give it that extra zing. What would you say that comes from um, with, with the session in particular? Which tobacco would give you that sensation? The uh, tobacco, we think it's from uh, uh, Condego, uh, from uh, uh, Nicaragua. Uh, we right. think that it's like that citrus kind of to us is almost like, like a grapefruit uh, mm -hmm. to us. And so that if, go, if you look at um, uh, Esteli, more spice to that uh, cigar. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, each region is different. So that's the reason, you know, it's so hard to, for me to say, oh, the blend has all Nicaragua and everybody's okay with that. Oh, it's all <laughs> Nicaragua. Yeah, but there's three or four regions in Nicaragua, and every region is different. And so that, you know, but I don't ever judge anybody because, again, unless I start to uh, give you fumas every time I have a new blend to share with you, okay, taste this one, taste it, and then you tell me where you taste that cigar and your experience smoking that cigar. That's the key, but it is very hard to do that. Yeah. We had a couple of questions coming in through Facebook, okay. and one was from, from Marvin, who's also in Austria. Hi, Marvin. Glad you're joining us. Um, he asked, um, what is the, the, the sweetest CAO that you think you have in the portfolio? Uh, the sweetest tobacco is going to be definitely the Amazon Basin. Uh, Amazon Basin will deliver you that, to me, a raisinous flavor, uh, that dry fruit, a very ripe dry fruit, uh, uh, like a, a raisin, a prune uh, that has a ton of sugar in it. And mm -hmm. so through the process of fermentation, what we're going to do is kind of heat that uh, tobacco up high in temperatures. What that does when you heat uh, the tobacco up in high temperatures is going to break the starch it down. And starch is what? Sugar. And so the higher the temperature you cook that tobacco through, the more that breaks that starch down, delivers you that sweetness that you desire. So that's the reason if you ever uh, try a Maduro and before you light it, just simply rotate it in your lips and you, bro, that is sweet. But we can disguise that, that sweetness with a blend. So we can overpower that sweetness and make that sweetness a one and the spice a 10. So, but every Maduro, because of the process to change that from a light brown to a deep brown, you have to, or deep black, you have to uh, uh, kind of pump in that uh, natural heat uh, to uh, uh, fermentation. It's going to break down that starch and turn it to sugars. But we can disguise that. We can take it out away or focus on that. Whatever style 
whatever target is uh, you're trying to achieve. Yep. Beautiful. We had another question from Thomas, and he asked, um, Ricky, have you ever used Ometepe? Uh, yeah, I'm going to use it in a, a new cigar called Bones uh, coming out in America in June. Uh, it is um, a tobacco that uh, we use on a mac and noodle in a Cohiba. And so uh, it's our first time that we at, at uh, CAO is going to use it. And we're not going to use it for a wrapper. We're going to use it for a, a filler. And so, yeah, uh, it's a, a very uh, unique tobacco. Uh, it can, uh, the reason we don't kind of like to uh, use it in a, a blend because it wants to dominate that blend. It really uh, wants to overpower every other tobacco it's a the bully of the uh, the uh, schoolyard it were you know it just wants mm -hmm. to overpower everything but uh, we're going to just uh, you know uh, kind of tame it down and only use about one maybe a half a leaf of that uh, uh, that but it's going to offer you something but we don't want to concentrate uh, we don't want that to be the story behind that blend yeah. yeah, I guess especially with that volcanic soil that you have Amazing. on Ometepe, you get a yeah. lot of very individual characteristics that yeah, you yeah. need to factor into the overall equation. Yeah. We had a great question from Aldo concerning blending. Welcome, Aldo. Welcome, welcome, everyone. And first of all, <clears throat> I have to find the microphone in the middle of my beer. Well, I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> first of all... <laughs> Thank you, Rick, because we, we, we met in Vienna a few years ago at the event. I remember. Yeah, it was fantastic. And well, you opened my eyes about uh, on a lot of things. Yes. And I remember that you make me play a game with that uh, cow pilon uh, Churchill. And uh, you cut out the first centimeter of the wrapper of the mm -hmm. cigar and you let me uh, smoke the cigar. So the first centimeter without the wrapper and then the wrapper arrives. And my question is, when, when you think about a new blend, a new, a new cigar or something, uh, do you start thinking from the wrapper and then you find the correct filler to fulfill the aromas of the wrapper or you go the opposite side, so you prepare the, uh, the, um, the filler and then you find which is the best wrapper to fulfill the, the aromas and the uh, taste of the filler? Great question. I think uh, I, I answered this way. 90% of the time, every manufacturer starts with a wrapper and we work from the wrapper inside uh, to the cigar. So I've always said to the fans that I'm talking to, picture your wrapper like your piece of uh, steak or beef or fish or uh, chicken. What you're going to apply to that beef or chicken or fish to enhance the flavor is everything. But uh, for us, uh, if I give you a, a steak naked, you're going to say, okay, it tastes like beef. Uh, it's tender, cooked very well, but there's something, oh, you know what? I forgot to use salt and pepper and garlic. That's the magic to enhance that flavor of that beef. So if you look at a cigar, your fillers are in place to enhance, not take away, but enhance your flavor of your wrapper. But there's some cigars that we want. So I've always said the fillers bow to the king, the wrapper. But some cigars, we want the wrapper to bow to the king, the filler. So if you look at Amazon Basin, Puma, uh, Ariano, we want you to experience the fillers, not the wrapper. Uh, Columbia, we want you to uh, experience the filler, not the wrapper. So you try to, if you do that, you're going to go down in your tobacco plant and offer your wrapper that's not going to be full flavored, but you're going to concentrate on your, uh, your blend instead of your wrapper. So, but 90% of the time, every manufacturer starts with a wrapper and what can I add to that, that steak? Uh, so sometimes, you know what? I've never used paprika on my steak. Let's try it. And you eat, bro, I don't want that steak every time with paprika, but you know what? It's not bad, but I love sugar and I love beef, but that combination would never work. I'm never going to serve your steak full with sugar on the top of it because it doesn't work. 
So yeah, ninety percent of the time. So uh, we're all lying to you that when any manufacturer says to you guys, the wrapper is about fifty to seventy percent of your flavor. My hand will go up and say, "How do you know that?" Well, my grandfather told my uh, dad, and my dad told me. Well, you're from the house of liars because you don't know that. But we that uh, you know situation I shared with you, I can show you where that flavor is because if you uh, have a cigar that you know, and this is a great thing to do, try it on a cigar that you know that you've been smoking for two years, five years, ten years. And take about this much of your wrapper off and light the cigar. Now you're lighting just the uh, the binder and the fillers. And you say, okay, this is not my cigar. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. And then it reaches that wrapper. There's an explosion of flavor. If you can say then, oh, there's 70% more flavor. There's, there's no way. But we know aging, fermentation techniques, that the wrapper is the most important component of the cigar 90% of the time. It's the, because we don't age fillers the way we do wrappers. Wrappers are can age for five years, 10 years. We will never age a filler for over two years because it, there's no reason because the wrapper is going to be the, the, the showcase of that cigar. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Really, thank you. By the way, Aldo has a fantastic new YouTube channel. You should all check it out. And Bruce also got a new YouTube channel um, that he's playing with Cigar Journal. Um, great stuff on there. So right. check that one out. And of course, Erica from TLE Podcast, they had a new episode um, they just launched recently. I had a little sneak preview of that. It's also a wonderful um, new episode. So tune in to, to these channels. Fantastic work that, that you're all doing. And we appreciate all your hard work. Um, Ricky, I, I think that also the, the, the Vitola has a tremendous impact on For the sure. perception of the wrapper, right? Because it, it will change and alter um, the percentage of wrapper in regards to the filler. For sure. Because, you know, uh, we're scared sometimes when we do an event. And uh, we, you know, 100% of the time, I have one sample and one size. And so I offer a six by 60 to you. And you're not a fan of six by 60. We know we may lose you. And so uh, for me to you guys, if somebody offers you a cigar and it's not your style, your shape, your uh, their link, uh, the ring gauge, don't give up on that cigar because that experience of a six by 60 you'll say to yourself i enjoy it but do you make other sizes yes i have you know five sizes in the flathead line i have a seven by 70 a six by 60 a five and a half by 54 a lancero and a spark plug it's going to be a four and a half by 52 you cannot tell me that lancero is going to give you the same experience mm -hmm. that that seven by 70 does so if I was you, and if you smoke it, and you get that kind of hint of flavor, I like it, but I will not ever buy a 6x60, try the other size. Because if you just give up and walk away, you may find a good nugget that you love, but you walked away from that line. So every time a manufacturer or friend or a salesman offers you a cigar, do you make uh, other sizes? They do. And uh, you know what? I'm not a big ring guy to, uh, so, or a Lancero. Uh, if I share a Lancero with you, bro, I don't like this thin little cigar. Do you have anything like a 7x70? Seven <laughs> ah, okay, yes, we do. But uh, don't give up. And don't give up. What I, I, For me to get a blend out of the market, I'll smoke about 100 of those samples before we launch it. Uh, for me to taste one cigar in the factory, every cigar in the factory tastes like heaven because I'm in that environment. I'm around friends. I'm seeing the tobacco, hearing the rollers, hearing the noises, smelling tobacco. When I get home with that same cigar and my wife starts to bitch talk to me, all of a sudden my favorite cigar is ruined. Your mood has a lot to do with your experience. 
If you have a bad day at work and you go to your local shop and I'm there, oh, Ricky's here, he's here. Yeah, I'm in not a good mood. I'm fucking, you know, work is, you know, shitty today. And here, try my new cigar and you smoke it. Yeah, no, yeah, not for me. Really? How's your new mood? Awful. It's going to affect your cigar. So for me to you, if you have a new cigar introduced to you, smoke about three to five of the cigars before you make your judgment of that cigar. Because that mood is going to affect your over our experience of a cigar. I couldn't agree more. Wonderful comment. Um, Addis over on Facebook sent me another question um, regarding blending. Um, are you more looking for like a long aftertaste or a clean finish that leaves you like really fresh and enlightened? It depends on the style of cigar we're uh, making. A, a, a mild cigar, I want that, uh, that uh, uh, the aftertaste to be gone. Uh, for a medium to a full body cigar, I wanted to linger a little bit, but not like a, a bad lingering, uh, like uh, something, you know, like a cat shit in your mouth kind of thing. But but I want you to experience something like, you know, bro, you know what, this is good uh, lingering. For, uh, for me, I, I, I hate kind of what I hate was I've smoked a cigar, I was smoking a cigar last night and the intake was unbelievable. When I released that smoke, I released all the flavor of the cigar too. And I'm like, oh, I don't like that. I didn't like that cigar because it was a medium to full body cigar. And it should be an aftertaste of that tobacco lingering in my mouth. But once I released that smoke, every flavor was gone. And I don't like that. Yeah. Personally, personally. Probably a good analogy to that. Like yesterday on the show, we had Florian Dubreuil from uh, the house of Remy Martin, um, fabulous cognacs. And with with spirits, obviously, and and with aged spirits in particular, you, you you're also looking for different styles. You know, you could have this very fresh, um, primarily fruit driven, younger qualities where you're looking for that clean, fresh finish, and with a more complex and more robust, super well aged and, and, and long matured quality like Louis Tres, you're more looking for that depth and complexity and the super long aftertaste. So probably that's that's a good analogy to go about it. You know, it's an, another thing I can share with you guys. Cigars are in your house uh, sometimes. Uh, there was a cigar that uh, was uh, made by Lagorius called Series R. And Series R was a legendary cigar from, uh, you know, Ernesto. And I remember the first time I smoked it, uh, uh, I was with Ernesto. And uh, we were, uh, I was a rep, and I was driving to, from Tampa to Orlando. And Ernesto says, uh, you know, have you ever experienced a uh, Lagoria Series R? I said, no, sir, I haven't. And uh, I remember I said, you know, what do you want? want? And I said, yeah, yes, I would love that. This is the blender giving me a cigar. And I smoked. And it was so dry. And so at that time, do I had the nerve enough to say, hey, Ernesto, your cigar is dry. And I lit it up and I was smoking. I, I said, oh my God, it's great. And I said, Ernesto, at the end of the day, we had a dinner. And I said, Ernesto, today you shared a cigar with me uh, called Series R. But I've noticed that when you handed it to me, uh, it was dry. Why? You know, because you just had it in your bag. And no, 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 Ricky. That cigar performs better, drier than wet. What do you mean? Oh, when I smoke a Series R uh, every day, if I want to smoke it on Saturday, on Friday night, I take that cigar out of my humidor and set it down outside of my humidor, and it dries it a little bit. And that tobacco performs better, drier. And he says, Ricky, it's like this. If I give you a shot a, of uh, a rum or a scotch, and then you sip it, and you say, oh, that's great scotch. And this next sip, he says, wait, I'm going to fill it with water. What is he doing? Diluted it down. So it's, it's going to tone that flavor down. He says, the same thing with tobacco. The wetter does not equal more flavor because it's going to have more moisture and less flavor. So if I was you guys, uh, experience uh, sometimes uh, take uh, your favorite cigar and set it outside of your humidor for, you know, uh, uh, 24 hours and smoke it. 
maybe you're fine. You know, I prefer my cigars straight from the humidor. Or, wow, that is completely different. So now I know to dry the cigar out a little bit more because we're all saying 72 humidity. Some cigars perform better at uh, 68 than 72. It's up to you to make the decision for yourself because I enjoy my Series R a little bit drier. It doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it, but for me to you, the master taught me some cigars performed a little bit better, drier tobacco. But the only thing that you have to worry about, dry tobacco is going to burn quicker too. So what that cigar should take you about a, an hour to smoke. You realize the, uh, the drier cigar is going to take you 45 minutes because it's going to burn quicker for you. So many great tips and advice. Um, amazing that you're sharing all these information information with us, Ricky. Laurent was actually asking for, for some more advice regarding lens. Okay. Yeah, hello. Hello, Ricky. Uh, yeah, um, I used to, to, to um, when I'm going to the, man, uh, the factory in Costa Rica, uh, I used to have the same uh, tobacco because uh, they have the tobacco in Esteli and we have uh, the production in uh, for the wrapper in Ecuador, but uh, uh, in in October I like to to taste some new things, and then uh, the idea is to go to 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 Nicaragua to buy uh, some tobacco. Uh, what's the best way? Because I've, uh, I heard several different things, but uh, what's the best way to to taste the 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 tobacco uh, to choose it? For instance, uh, uh, do you have to to buy some gavillas? Uh, or uh, and then test uh, separately the ligero and then the, the volado the seco uh, to 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 yeah or not what's the best no, way? I, I I would definitely do that. and uh, what I'm uh, finding out the deeper I get into the business is when they're growing that tobacco eat uh, uh, also represents different flavors so if you have a harvest that's from the springtime versus the fall totally different. So my question to your manufacturer you're working with, when was this tobacco grown? Oh, who are you? I've never been asked this question. Well, I want to sample uh, the two tobaccos that that farm grew this year, one in the spring and the one in the fall. And you will notice a, a huge difference uh, because the tobacco that we're planting in the springtime has a lot of uh, sunshine. Uh, because it's turning into the summer. But the tobacco that we uh, plant uh, in, uh, you know, maybe in September, uh, that harvest, it's because the sunlight is not that intense, is going to be different. So my uh, thing for you, smoke the Volado, the Seco, the Lajero, but also when was this kind of planted and when was it harvest? And that will show you a lot because... All right, you can have the same blend, the same cigar, one done in the spring and one done in the fall, and it's a different experience. And so that is something that I realized that the farmers don't ever tell you because it's hard to control that because they have so much tobacco they need to get rid of. And if you're the guy that only want tobacco lajero from the springtime, but I want my seco from the fall time, there you are, or you driving me crazy. But as a manufacturer, that's your job. Drive these guys crazy because at the end of the day, it's you that they're, they're going to see, not the farmer. So demand, demand everything you can and get away. Now, can you control them? You have to have that relationship that you can believe in them, that they're selling you the tobacco that you want. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard. It's a relationship. You have to get in bed with this guy and, and let him trust you. And you can trust him and say, only give me the tobacco from the fall or the uh, springtime for the blend, for this blend. Yeah. And just, just last thing, um, except the, the Ligero, uh, what's the, the best way to, to, to influence the, uh, to, to get a, a cigar more stronger? Because I used to, 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 to use double Ligero or something like that, but uh, do you can maybe uh, have some 
something special, different? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because uh, fermentation. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, every tobacco goes through three fermentation. When you receive the tobacco from the farm, it's going to go to the first fermentation, maybe about three months. And then we kind of bell the tobacco and we house it uh, in the bells for about uh, three months. And then the second fermentation. And that is where we start to select. Uh, this is binder, this is filler, this is wrapper. And the uh, third fermentation is to get that color uh, the same, uh, uniform. And so uh, for me to create more body uh, under fermented tobacco will give you that, but how long is that ferment, uh, you know, fermentation? So uh, if it's you know, three months and not three months more, but uh, how, uh, how about you guys share with me three months of fermentation and the second fermentation only two months. And then don't worry about the third fermentation. But if the longer you ferment the, the, the tobacco, the, the flavor is going to increase, but the body is going to decrease. So Lajero is very hard to work with because it's going to kind of overshadow your wrapper. So instead of using more Lajero, maybe try to under ferment your wrapper, but give you the flavor that you want, but the body also comes with that. But you don't want body over flavor for me. Mm -hmm. I don't like just a full body cigar to kick my butt. I want some flavor too. Yeah, if, if, if very, it's very easy for you to go to manufacturers that I want a full body cigar. We love you, love you. But when you uh, challenge us, I want a full body cigar with flavor. Yep. Oh, you're that guy. You're a guy. Yes, I'm that guy because my name is on that cigar. This is what I want from you. And if you can't do it, somebody else can. Yeah, for sure. So if you don't want to use more Lajero, play with your fermentation and the aging or fermentation of the wrapper. And that will dictate body and flavor too, for sure. Speaking of Thank tobacco, Ricky, one thing that truly really stands out for CEO is the curiosity of bringing new tobacco sensations. And uh, you, well, we had um, CAO Bilon that, that, that was new to the market. Now the session, obviously the, the trilogy from, from the Amazon. Um, tell us a little bit about that approach and, and why that is so special with CAO. Well, I would love to answer that question about five years ago. Uh, because uh, five years ago, I had carte blanche to do anything I wanted, any tobacco I wanted to play with. Today in the U.S., we have the FDA, and the FDA is now uh, saying to us, uh, no more new blends, no more new tobaccos. And so we have to play with uh, uh, older blends, but uh, they give you a, a leeway to uh, to – they're concentrated on the seed, not the tobacco. That's a great news for any manufacturer because we can take a blend that we created in 1970 that was using Volado, very mild tobacco. Now we can use Seiko or Lajero uh, out there, and that's going to be even better. Uh, but uh, I, I also can plant that same seed in different countries. That's great, too. But then, you know, uh, for me, uh, we're going to the point that I cannot offer you guys new tobaccos from if somebody says there's a new tobacco from Argentina uh, because it's not a predicate for tobacco, I can't use it. But Europe can, can because Europe doesn't have the FDA. But in general, like just the approach and, and how you go about a finding those tobaccos and then working your way around them. I mean, the, the whole process with with Amazon Basin, for example, that was uh, were a very finicky process, right? In order yeah, to, yeah. To, to get that tobacco to where you wanted it to be. For me, uh, for me, uh, you know, that was back in the day that we were able to receive new tobaccos. Uh, that tobacco was uh, given to us by the, uh, uh, the buyer of tobacco for us, he was in Brasilia. And I remember he said to uh, the, uh, the growers, uh, CEO is looking for something new. What do you have? 
and they were saying, guys, you're using every tobacco that we have right now. And one guy says, hey, how about that Amazon tobacco that nobody wants? Oh, yeah. They'll, you know, like Mikey, he'll try it. So we tried it. And they, I was in the factory when we received it. And it was so unique, so different. It's the only tobacco that, uh, that we never fermented, never aged, because it was ready to use right away. But it came to us in a kind of a, uh, a uh, tube. It's about four feet long, about this thick. And we started to play. How do you use the tobacco? Because when you unroll the tobacco, and they roll it in tercio. Tercio is a, a, a kind of a, a leaf from a palm tree that you can roll your tobacco in and it's going to keep it moist. And they bear the tobacco under the tree and the tree produces a fruit that's sweet and falls and interacts with that tobacco. But now we have this huge kind of um, uh, tuba tobacco that we can't divide because it's so infused together. We started to cut a puck. So how do I get this puck in the cigar? And so we started to shave. If you ever open up and never do this, just trust me when I say don't destroy any Amazon basin. But if you open it up, it looks like a piece of beef jerky in your tobacco. It's shavings. Uh, but that's the only way that we can apply that tobacco in the cigar. And so it was a, a experience for us to use that tobacco. Uh, we worked on that uh, technique uh, for maybe maybe uh, seven months uh, to, to get this process. And we started with 100% uh, of the tobacco, overwhelming, uh, down to 30%, down to 70%, 50%. And then we discovered what to do and how much to use to uh, showcase that the, the, the tobacco. Yeah. Did, you ever, did you ever think about going back to that tobacco and revisiting it for other new, new lines or other new projects? Because the Amazon Basin, I mean, it, it's a limited run and, and, and highly sought after, but um, any plans on bringing that back? No, because uh, what, what happens is they only grow about a, a 5,000 pounds a year. That's it. So even if we wanted to do a full-time a launch of this, we don't have access to the tobacco because they only, the Indians only grow about 5,000 pounds a year. So we try to convince them to grow more. They said, no, 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 5,000 pounds is 5,000 pounds. So that's it. And so no, we, we could not uh, use it in the a line that we can uh, put on the market every day, every month, every year now, because we don't have access to the tobacco. Yeah, for sure. But maybe uh, another limited run at some point. Who knows? Well, like I'll share this with you guys. We're going to launch it one more time because the FDA uh, said to us in May, at the uh, the end of May, every non predicate blend has to be off the market because of the uh, the virus that we're going through. The FDA said, you know what, guys, we're going to extend that date until. I think uh, now the date is going to be in um, maybe in uh, September. And so we're going to release one more time the Amazon Basin and the Oriano in America, uh, 5,000 boxes, uh, 3,000 boxes of the Amazon Basin and 2,000 boxes of the Oriano. But the good news and what we're trying to do is convince the marketing team and the sales team in Europe, we can make that cigar for you guys, for the from now on. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, we're going to be able to share that line and next year and 2022, 2023, 2024. We cannot offer that cigar in the US, but we can offer it in Europe. And uh, we would love to do that to share a cigar that the, uh, the Americans don't have. That because we're kind of, you know, in the situation, ha, 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 we have bones, you don't have bones, you don't have bones. Now you're going to say, ha, 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 we have Amazon base and you don't have Amazon base. Ah! So I think uh, we're going to be able to keep it alive in Europe, I hope, for you guys. Uh, the only way we're going to keep it alive is uh, your demanding of that cigar when you see it. Uh, bro, I love this cigar. I will support this cigar. I need more. I need more. 
and uh, that's going to speak heavy for us. Yeah, that's great news, and you heard it on Light 'em Up. <laughs> yeah, be on the now I'd be fired for that information I just shared. <laughs> Not at all. I'm sure people will appreciate it tremendously. Uh, um, how about the Pilon and the the Nicaragua project? Because they're also both very important lines for CEO. Uh, yeah, uh, Pilon is uh, you know a classic uh, case that uh, we try to uh, give you uh, well give the the fans to see a cubanesque style cigar uh so the fermentation process that uh, we apply to Pallone is unlike any other cigar that we ever fermented it because it's a circular Pallone and what it does is takes us double the time so usually to ferment tobacco typically it takes you about six to uh, nine months this fermentation uh, process takes you about uh uh, 15 months to 18 months because it's no uh, the weight, the pressure, the heat. We can't uh, cr increase the uh, uh, the temperatures because we don't have that much tobacco. You can't make a circular flown and have the weight behind it. So typically, uh, a fermentation process that we're doing a typical flown, we have about 5,000 to 7,000 pounds of tobacco being fermented. When we're doing uh, the uh, the other cigar, uh, we only have about two thousand to three thousand pounds, and they, it takes. It's kind of like uh, preparing a roast in your oven, and you can do it in uh, three hours, or you can prepare that roast in a crock pot that takes you uh, eight hours to do. Uh, at the end of the day, that process is going to deliver you more flavor. Uh, but it was a process that Cuban gave up. The Cuban manufacturers gave up on about 100 years ago because the process took too, too long. And so we just brought that back uh, to the, uh, uh, and then I wanted to uh, make a, a kind of a Cuban X box, a very simple uh, production, a very simple looking, but to me, very elegant. The band is elegant. The box speaks for itself. It tells you the story. If you look at the uh, cigar box and the cigar band, you have the circle of Pallone, and we're trying to kind of tell you this is different, guys. This is a different process. And so that is uh, what made Pallone. And today, uh, Pallone is the number one selling cigar in Europe. Uh, and so it's a uh, number seven bestseller in the U.S., uh, but we're not going to give up on it because we just enjoy the cigar. There's fans of the cigar, and we want to showcase the uh, cigar. And so we're going to showcase the cigar in 2021 again and really reintroduce to the market by offering a different kind of technique. And uh, we're going to say, don't forget about Pallone because this is a cigar that we believe in. And everybody that smokes it and finds it, oh, my God, it's going to find a place in my uh, humidor for sure. And so that's a Pallone. Nicaragua was a challenge for us, very uh, because when uh, they were looking at the world line, so the world line represents Brasilia, America, Italia, uh, Colombia. And then we're saying, okay, we have the, all these countries highlighted, but how about our home, Nicaragua? Because we manufacture in Nicaragua, but we don't have a cigar named Nicaragua. So they came to, uh, marketing came to me and said, we want you to do a Nicaragua cigar. I said, stop. No, I, I don't want to. Why? Because there's so many cigars out there in the market for Nicaragua. And so we're not really that known for that. And there's Papine is out there doing a great job in representing. Uh, AJ Fernandez doing a great job. And uh, Padron doing a great job. And these guys are focused on Nicaragua. And now we're going to introduce our cigars. And so I got, uh, got with a team in Nicaragua. And we started to kind of talk about this. And I said, guys, every coin has two sides. And so one, uh, one side represents Nicaragua that they're doing today. Uh, when you say Nicaragua, I automatically think full body, spicy, in your face, a man cigar. So can we showcase a flavor of Nicaragua and take out the boldness? And that is Nicaragua we want you to enjoy. So we know that uh, fans of full body cigars will sacrifice body for flavor. But flavor guys, mild to medium bodies guys, will never sacrifice 
flavor for body. So they're going to say, uh, nope. And you know what? I've experienced a Nicaraguan cigar. That's not my style. I, I'm, I'm, hey, uh, I, you know, Bruce is talking. Uh, but uh, I said, if we can showcase Nicaragua and the beautiful flavors of Nicaragua without the bonus, that's the cigar we want to make. So, yes, uh, that was a challenge. But uh, thank God we did it because uh, right now it's one of my favorite cigars. I smoke about... Um, one every other day. It's one of my go-to cigars for sure. If you never right. experience that cigar, do yourself a favor and realize it's not that Nicaragua you used to. It's going to give you a different experience. And I think you're going to be uh, pleased with the experience that you're going to have with the Nicaragua. Super interesting. Um, another question came in from Henrik, who is on the show with us. Well, uh, I'm not actually Henrik, I'm Pierre, but uh, the name... Oh, I love you, bro. Hey, hey, Rick. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, it's good. And you? It's just, it's just... So Where's I have your a cocktail? Question. Where's your cocktail? No, no cocktail. I have a whiskey. Okay. <laughs> it's a Spanish whiskey. You know, uh, actually, a project with John. You remember Vistison, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Sure. you should try sure. that whiskey when you get the chance. It's fantastic. I would love that. Yes. Yes. So I actually have a question, and there is an easy answer to it. So uh, you're probably going to choose that. But uh, I sometimes wonder why don't you do like a single like estate cigar? You know, like a real pu pure from like a single place. Or you do yeah. like like 2001, 2002, 2003. You know. Nobody does that, and I've always been curious why. Because, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the reason we start down the road, and if you say we're going to offer your cigar a puro from one country for 2020, 2021, 2022, and then 2021 comes around, and the farmer says, Hey, a horrible crop too much sun, too much rain, all of a sudden you're stuck. So yes, you can do it one time. Uh, it's going to be a short batch. It's a puro, but uh, you don't want to get in the uh, situation that you're going to be caught uh, with tobacco that you can't use, or if you use it, it's going to be so different. And uh, bro, I thought last year was great. This year's just is awful. And so that's going to be a bing or, a, you know, kind of a... Uh, but don't you think that would, like, uh, create new experiences if you go that road? Yeah, but if you look at Padron, Padron is a uh, puro from Nicaragua every year. Every yeah, yeah, year. yeah, but I, yeah. I mean like a single estate, like the field, you know. Yeah, uh, but again... <laughs> like I, I have this fantastic field on the mountain slope or and you do it like handcraft the, the, like the cuban way and yep. you get this spectacular thing year out and year in you know yeah it's a very hard but uh, you know what i've never had the situation presented to me to do that uh would i do it for sure uh, for sure we wanted to do it with Nicaragua. We really wanted to showcase Nicaragua with the fillers, the binder, and the wrapper. But when we were smoking that cigar, it wasn't performing for us. So that's the reason we're using a, uh, a Honduran uh, binder and wrapper to sh uh, showcase the fillers. Uh, but yeah, I, I would be interested in it, but you have to trust that, uh, that uh, farmer to give you exactly what you want uh, from them and mm. trust sometimes is <laughs> I would love to say that uh, we can trust my company the growers but uh, sometimes uh, trust is not there for us so yeah but I, I agree with you I think it would be interesting I know there was a project for Macanoodle, uh back in the day about 10 years ago that they want to focus on one farm in uh, the DR and create that uh, style that like you're talking about one farm that we're even thinking about uh, putting the, in the, uh, the fields cameras that you can actually see the tobacco grow and then you can buy that one plant. And then we're going to 
follow that plant throughout the fermentation, the aging, and then five years later, hey, you remember that plant that you were watching grow? Here's your cigar. And that, uh, that sounds some, spectacular, you know. Yeah, but yeah, but <laughs> we're trying to do that, but uh, nobody says, bro, no, I don't want any cameras in my fields and all that. So I don't know. No. Okay. Well, thank you for but that. But I want to, you know, thank you. But I would love to, but I've never been to, uh, presented with that op uh, opportunity. Yeah, okay. for sure. Speaking of opportunities that you were presented with, um, was there ever an opportunity to do like a, um, a collaboration with the different manufacturers or have you ever looked into that? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, for CAO, um, it's not kind of, I'm not saying that we don't need it, uh, but uh, well, like AJ, we have partner up with AJ and he makes some uh, uh, cigars for punch. Uh, so uh, to uh, combine uh, a CAO with another manufacturer, kind of why do we do that? Uh, if it makes sense, if I had the opportunity to work with a manufacturer, uh, I, yeah, yes, I have in mind who I would work with. I would love to work with uh, Ernesto because Ernesto taught me. So if Ernesto ever reached out to me or I reach out to Ernesto, I think the answer would be yes. I would love to work with you, Ricky. And the same thing, uh, Nestle, yes, I would love to work on a cigar with you. But uh, again, that situation never been presented to me, uh, but I never would, uh, you know, close the door. I don't need anybody because I, I, bro, I would love to go to their factory and learn their process and w see that how they do and how they chew tobacco and what can I learn from that. And so, yeah, I would love that, but it's never been presented to me. Which brings us swiftly back to the session that we actually started with, right? I mean, first of all, the session features a Connecticut broadleaf, which is probably one of your favorite tobaccos, as far as I'm concerned. Plus, it sort of brought you back home, because unlike a couple other CAO cigars, this one is actually manufactured in the Dominican Republic. Yes. Uh, the first time that, uh, uh, you know, a CEO has all, uh, ever launched a cigar outside of Nicaragua. And so uh, I just want, uh, I think uh, the story goes like this. Uh, they did say to me, okay, we're going to make, make sessions. You think you know the blend. Uh, we want you to go home. Uh, where did you start your training? I said, in the DR. Uh, do you want to work with your old team? Are you asking me or telling me? Because my answer is yes and yes, uh, because I would love to go home and work with uh, these uh, guys again. So I was lucky enough to, that the, uh, the uh, uh, factory said yes to us. And so, uh, yes, uh, this is the only cigar that uh, CEO ever made outside of Nicaragua. And it, uh, to me, uh, when I work with, uh, you know, broadly, uh, I think of uh, Macanudo, I think of um, uh, 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 La Gloria, uh, I think of, you know, I cut my teeth. I learned to appreciate that tobacco through the DR. So for me to work, uh, have the, or the opportunity to go back to the DR and work with a rapper that I love, that really, General Cigar really babied and brought to the showcase. And so, yeah, it was uh, amazing to me, the opportunity to go back and uh, watch them roll the cigar because every factory's rolling techniques are different. Every process is different. So that's going to allow me to offer uh, the fans of CEO, uh, you think you know us, try mm -hmm. this cigar. And they're like, oh my God, I've never tasted this style of, of CEO. Yes, exactly. We don't want to give you over and over the same cigar, same style, same flavors. So why not different techniques, different uh, uh, fermentation process, different aging process, different rolling techniques, and it's going to offer you a different cigar. It's a, a very exciting for me to go back. So not just on your side, but actually for the people that you were working with in DR, what did it mean to them to finally have you coming back to those roots? They were very excited, too, because, you know, uh, we all follow, uh, follow each other. And uh, they know that uh, CAO right now in General Cigar is one of the most popular 
uh, companies in General Cigar for them to say, oh, we want to kind of chai our wagon to your success. Uh, yeah, because it maybe will showcase our talents here and uh, the tale will help us uh, tell our stories for the uh, Macanu, Cohiba, uh, Particus, La Gloria, because we made a cigar with CAO and uh, that's going to open the eyes of a lot of people because they, I think a lot of people look at, uh, you know, uh, Nick, uh, uh, the DR like, oh, that was my grandfather's, my uh, father's cigars coming out of the DR. I'm the new guy, so I like Nicaragua, Honduras. So I think they believe that uh, we can offer a great cigar, but they're going to capture some of the love for our fans and also some of their fans. So if you're a Macanudo uh, uh, smoker, and I've never tried a, uh, you know, a CAO, but this is made in your factory you love. Really, I'll try it. So that combination works for both of us. But uh, the hugs and the hellos and uh, the greetings that I received was, bro, it's, it was going home. It was going to that, you know, that home. And you open the door, all your cousins, all your siblings, your mother, your father, your grandmother, they're all there for you waiting. You have a life outside your home, but you have your friends, you have your family, but going home sometimes, there's a feeling inside you're like, oh my God, this is home. This is home. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. One more question from Peter up in Norway. Um, do you have some like secret stock of special tobaccos or for vintages that you're planning to release in the near future? Yeah, I have a, a special uh, cigar that uh, we started to work on about uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Cameroon, uh, but uh, we're going to release a new cigar using Cameroon. And it's changing my uh, kind of my thoughts of Cameroon because I went to, you know, when they said, to, uh, we want you to make a new Cameroon. Uh, cigar and they all know that I'm not a big fan of Cameroon like a chef uh, I can make anything you want to eat but I don't eat everything I can uh, I cook uh, so if you go to your local restaurant and you know the uh, chef and you show the chef that menu and say hey bro you like everything you cook and you'll look around hey bro I don't like fish really there's one two three fish dishes on your menu Oh no, I can, I'm a, a, a chef. I can cook anything, but I don't eat everything. So Cameroon, I just rely on my team. Uh, and then I relied on Benji. So I went to Miami and said, Benji, I've been challenged to make a Cameroon cigar. Can you help me uh, make a Cameroon cigar? And we worked together for about six months. And uh, it is, I, I, I can say this, it's changed the mind of the way I look at Cameroon. Uh, for this cigar. So I, I think it's going to be released in um, maybe in November this year. And so when you see it, I think uh, if you're a Cameroon fan, you're going to love it. If you're on the fucking, you know, the fence, I don't know if I try it because you're going to, okay, this is not like my grandfather's Cameroon. I've never experienced this flavor coming from Cameroon. Yeah. <clears throat> Ricky, it's such an interesting session and, and it's such a pleasure to, to talk to you about all your experience and, and all like the, the, the effort and the, and the passion that you bring to the table. It's fantastic. Laurent asked us, what's your favorite part of the job and what would you like to do that you do not do at this very moment? My favorite part of my job is uh, to connect with the fans of CEO. Uh, we think uh, it's blending, it's not blending, it's not the factory, it's uh, being able to go out there and share the stories, uh, pull the curtain, uh, you know, open so you can get a, a, a kind of a snapshot of what we do in the factory. And so that comes from Benji. Uh, Benji taught me uh, to, uh, to be able to go out there and share your knowledge. Uh, there's, you know, uh, three ways you're going to be able to share. Oh, to, uh, over talk them too much information or, you know, talk to them like, uh, you know, you don't know the difference by now, Maduro or natural, really? How long you've been smoking? But just talk to them. So uh, for me, my funnest part of my job is uh, meeting new people, sharing, uh, you know, my mail out with everybody. My job is to help you enjoy your cigar a little bit more tomorrow 
than you did today by knowledge. If I can help you understand why you enjoy uh, Maduro or why you enjoy that blend or why you enjoy that technique, uh, that's going to be, uh, uh, for me, a success. Uh, so number one is that. Uh, number two to uh, what I'm doing, you know, I, I, I did it all because, uh, you know, I, I remember the first time they uh, offered me to go to Europe. Uh, that was very scary for me because I've never been to Europe. And uh, that opened my eyes to this beautiful continent called uh, Europe. And I went to China. And so, uh, bro, I'm lucky. I, I don't know. I don't think on my list of things to do, uh, that's all been checked off. Um, I am living a life that I never, ever dreamed I would be living today. And uh, I'm so lucky that I do what I do because I love what I do and I love the people I'm doing it with and I love to meet anybody and everybody that enjoys cigars. I don't care if you join Padron, Fuente, Sale. I don't care. As long as you enjoy a cigar, you and I can sit down and have a great conversation. And that is what I live for. Such a wonderful comment. And it's also exactly what we're trying to do here with the Light em Up initiative is to bring people together from all over the world, you know, to connect cigar aficionados from Asia, Europe, the US and share these wonderful moments and share these wonderful stories with all you people. It means the world to us. Um, I would also like to let you know that we have an exciting schedule ahead of ourselves. Um, on Sunday, we will have Jose Blanco, the professor, joining us for a delightful session. Legendary. And Don't miss that show. Do not miss that show. He's absolutely. a great, great gentleman and, and a we'd, great teacher. We'd, and we'd be honored to have you on the show as well, Ricky. And then next that. week, we have also a super exciting uh, schedule. On Wednesday, we will we'll do an AJ Fernandez special feature. Um, on Friday, we have uh, Tony and Lito joining us from La Flor Dominicana. Wow. And next Sunday, then it's going to be Omar from Fratello Cigars. So another one you, you certainly yeah. do not want to miss. So no. no. exciting week ahead. Um, we had one more question from Peter. So Peter, please bring that one up. I saw you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, I was still enjoying the session, Rick. Yep. Um, I've heard you talking about the General Cigar Factory in Dominican Republic. I visited in last February, January, by thanks of uh, Henry and Stein from Scandinavian Tobacco Group. And I just want to give my compliments about the factory, how it looks like, how the people are doing, and um, how you create your cigars over there. It looks magnificent. It's amazing. It is amazing because we are uh, we are the one of the biz, uh, biggest uh, manufacturer in the world, but uh, the passion behind everybody that you can in contact with. If you don't walk out of the factory and say, you know what, I thought that they didn't care, I'm so wrong. Everybody from the guy that was sweeping the floor to the guy that was in charge of that factory opened their arms, opened their, uh, their, you know, uh, their stories to us. Uh, guys, you have to realize this. We live in some great countries. And for us to, you know, if General Cigar ever come to me and say, Ricky, your days of working for General Cigar is over, don't worry about me. I'll be okay. But when we shut up down the factories because we can't sell cigars, enough cigars to keep these guys busy, you devastate families. You devastate a family. So for me to you guys, every cigar, I don't care what manufacturer you do, you have to realize you're helping a family out every time you buy a cigar and light it up and smoke and enjoy it. Because that family, if they can, thank you. I guarantee you everybody that touch that, uh, uh, that cigar will reach out to you and share this uh, thing with you. Thank you because you helped me provide for my family. For me to you guys, thank you so much for doing that because these guys are, you know, it's hard. It's a hard job to do, uh, to roll a cigar every day, uh, eight uh, hours a day, every uh, uh, week, every year. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, but these guys are doing it every day and uh, I just thank them and, uh, uh, know that you're helping not that company. You're helping 
a family survive in a horrible situation sometimes, Nicaragua, Honduras, the DR. These are not rich countries. So these guys have an ability to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to raise their families, to support their family. And they all thank us. I, every time I, please tell the fans of CAO, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hear it all the time. So yeah, if, they can't, uh, if they can't be here, I can do this for them. Thank you so much. From the lady who hold the door, the door when we first walk in to everybody to the end till packaging the cigars in boxes. Everybody over there in the factory is breeding cigars. Actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me the funny fact is because I never saw it before was the green flags on the roller tables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was really great to see them and how proud they are with the green. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's great. Pretty yeah. Ricky, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, and especially in challenging times like these that we're facing now. Um, like there, there's so many questions coming in, and, and we still get um, comments and, and, and direct messages through Facebook because people love your session, Ricky. Um, right, but right. we had one from Stefano, who's joining us from Switzerland. Um, how about the current situation? Did you have to, to, to lay any people off, or how were you dealing with those challenging economical circumstances? Uh, laying people off, no, we didn't, uh, but we did uh, close the factories in, uh, uh, in Honduras in the DR to be safe, uh, to provide for these families. Uh, but uh, we're back and running. Uh, all the factories are back open. Uh, so everybody, we had no, absolutely not one layoff. And so uh, right now, because we need a production. So thank God uh, they're uh, very busy right now. So everybody is back to work. Uh, so no, we had no layoffs, uh, but uh, we had to close our factories uh, in the DR for about uh, six weeks in the Honduras for about a month, but they're all back and working and very happy to do their job. Yeah, for sure. Thank That's you so awesome. much for, uh, you know, uh, mentioning the uh, factory like that. Wonderful. Many thanks. And also we had a lot of, of people requesting whether uh, the light them up will continue after the corona crisis and we we certainly do this for all of you guys for the cigar family and we need all your support and we need we need you on on this to be part of this global family that that we're building here but it means the world to me and and let me rest you all assured we will continue and light them up is is here to stay and we will continue doing these wonderful sessions and having great people like yourself ricky on the call and I'm beyond grateful that you're all supporting us and helping us to, to grow, to grow this project. It means the world to me. Anytime, anytime you need me, uh, the answer is yes. Before you ask me, yes, I would love to be a part of it again, because I, like I said, I'm seeing so many family, uh, friends and all that, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I met in the Europe. So yeah, anytime you need me, the answer is yes. Please. Thank you so much. I couldn't think of a better way to end this conversation. I would like to thank you all for being part of this wonderful show tonight. Ricky, thank you so much for everything that you shared with us. It means the world to me. So have Thanks, a Ricky. Thank you. Very so oh, look at that. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, bro. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. I hopefully sooner than the Zoom event. I, I hope to see you uh, live uh, one day uh, soon. Thank you very much. Back to Have Boston sometime soon, Ricky. I will. I will. Take care, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Many thanks, Ricky. Take care, right. and we'll bye -bye. see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.